So moving on, I want to talk about different relationships between species, whether that's the same species or different species. Um, because our ecosystems are quite diverse, we do have different relationships occurring between all the organisms that are living in the same area. Um, I do want to talk about and clarify that an intra-specific relationship, you're talking about the same intra, same specific species, same species relationship. So maybe that's the relationship of mating rituals. Maybe that's the relationship of competition between the same species. That's intra-specific. An inter-specific relationship is going to be different species. And I'm really going to focus on interspecific relationships in the next part of the lecture. So in this image, I'm showing you a beautiful um, savanna, um, Kenyan savanna community, and how diverse that community is. I'm actually going to be showing you all these different relationships that are going on in that image. All of them we can actually see in this still. So a negative, negative interaction, what I mean by negative and negative, I mean that neither species benefits. <clears throat> These are negative for both species. Um, for instance, maybe they don't have access to full range of resources offered by the habitat. Uh, in this example here, I'm showing you scavenger hunters. So the hyenas are an example of a scavenger hunter, the vultures, are an example of a scavenger hunter, they're going to compete for the same food source. We can see those guys kind of waiting for um, the carcass, the zebra carcass, after the lion's done with it. Those guys, since they compete with each other, neither one is going to benefit from that interaction. It's negative that the vulture has to compete with a hyena. It's negative that the hyena has to compete with a vulture. Maybe there's a clear winner, but it's still a negative relationship that they have to expend that energy to compete. That is a negative, negative interaction. A positive, positive interaction is mutually beneficial to both species. So they both benefit from this relationship. An example here, I can't really see it too much in the image, but maybe these flowers right here, they have pollen and they want to go ahead and pollinate another flower in order to sexually reproduce. Those flowers have pollinators. Let's say a bee comes in and pollinates. Well, that bee is going to benefit because that bee gets food. That flower benefits because it has achieved pollination process. So that's a positive, positive interaction. A positive negative interaction is where one species benefits, the other is not. The very obvious uh, example here is that lion is going to benefit by killing and eating the zebra. The zebra does not benefit from that interaction at all. It is a positive negative interaction. Another weird but very much uh, likely event is a positive null interaction. A positive null interaction is telling me that one species benefits and the other one neither benefits nor is harmed. It's just there. So an example of a positive null interaction are these scavenger um, animals here waiting to eat the leftovers of the zebra for the lion. When the lion's done, those guys can have the leftovers. The lion is neither benefiting from that interaction nor is harmed. The lion has taken his kill, has taken his energy needs from the zebra. Lion walks away. Uh, I should say lioness. Um, these guys, scavenger animals, are going to benefit very much from that interaction. They have energy needs being met. Okay, let's first talk about a negative-negative example. This is competition. Uh, in competition, you have species, and I'm going to focus on interspecific competition. So this is different species for the lecture. In competition, you're actually having species compete for a resource. Usually it's going to be food. I'm giving you an example of space. Space is a resource to live, as we see with these barnacles that I'm going to be showing you all. An ecological niche is defined as that species having the biotic 
and abiotic resources in its environment at its disposal. So we're talking about for biotic means usually food is a great example for that. What is it, what is it going to acquire by energy means? Abiotic, the climate, space or the density is going to be a factor in its ecological niche. And so we need to have a very nice ecological niche uh, for the organism to thrive in their environment. Uh, the competitive exclusion principle states that if two species have a similar ecological niche, they cannot coexist in the same place. They're going to compete with each other since they have similar niches where there's only so much resource to go around. So here we can actually see two different barnacles. Let's focus on figure A on top. So here I have the thalamus barnacle. Thalamus is going to be this brown color. And this guy has an ecological niche where it's going to prefer being on this rock, being pretty happy, close to the water. Well, the balanus as well is also going to prefer this similar ecological niche. And we can actually see that the range of the thalamus is going to be restricted when balanus is present. However, if I go in as an ecologist and remove the balanus from this area of rock, just no more balanus is located there, I'm actually going to see that thalamus increases in density. That population, those population numbers increase significantly. That's because now they're able to grow at greater numbers because there's no longer competition for the space on that rock. So this is a negative, negative relationship. The thalamus is not benefiting from that relationship. So they're, because since they are competing for the space, the thalamus is not benefiting. They're competing for the space as well. In mutualism, we have two different species that are benefiting from that relationship. I have some beautiful examples to show you guys. So this is called a mutualistic uh, relationship. You might also see this as symbiosis <clears throat> in other texts. So here I have an example of a hummingbird. There's that guy with his long bill, and that guy is going into this beautiful flower right here to get some nectar, nice juicy sugary nectar. That nectar is going to supply that hummingbird high energy requirements for that guy um, with those energy needs, food, and the flower benefits. So that hummingbird is definitely benefiting from getting food. Well, that flower benefits too because that hummingbird, you can't see it, but there's lots of different pollen grains that is um, getting on that bill of the hummingbird in addition to the head. And so all those pollen grains are now going to be transferred and help that flower pollinate another in order to contribute to the next generations. So that's a positive, positive interaction. Uh, here with this guy is an interesting example. This is a ruminant. So here's a cow. And in the cow, we actually have a very interesting stomach system uh, for this animal. In the stomach, we actually have, in the rumen portion, we have lots of bacteria, heavy, heavy, heavy amounts of bacteria for this guy. And the bacteria benefit because they are getting a spot to live, a nice, warm, juicy spot in the cow, in the stomach of the cow. And whatever the cow ingests, those bacteria are able to live off of and meet their energy needs. That's great for the bacteria. You're thinking, why does the cow benefit having all that bacteria? That sounds nasty. It's actually quite beneficial for the ruminant to have this bacteria because the bacteria aids in the digestion of very tough products such as cellulose. Remember that we humans are not great at digesting cellulose. So the cell wall composition of plants but ruminants are able to digest this quite efficiently because of the bacteria. It helps them out with this process, the digestion of that tough cellulose. That's a positive, positive relationship. Uh, last one I want to go over are these clownfish right here. They live, they have a nice little home in these anemones. Nice little spot for them to live. Well, that anemone, well, so the clownfish benefits since they have a home. The anemone benefits because clownfishes are actually quite bullies or mean little guys. And any predators that come near that would want to munch on the anemone, those clownfish ward off and they attack. So both organisms benefit in this relationship. 
Predation is the first positive negative interspecific interaction I want to go over. In predation, we have one organism benefiting, the other one not at all. So here I have many different examples where I have a predator being shown and it is eating its prey. Um, here I can see this grizzly bear waiting, just waiting for that nice juicy salmon to jump into its mouth at that time of the year in Alaska. Uh, that's definitely predation. That bear is benefiting, getting its energy requirements. And the fish, not so much at all. <clears throat> Here I have a hungry polar bear hunting a seal. That seal, unfortunately, looks quite old to me. And it looks like that polar bear kind of creeping up back here is probably going to get that guy as a nice meal later on that night. Uh, that polar bear will meet his energy requirements positive. That seal, unfortunately, will be preyed upon. Negative interaction. Numerous adaptations for this predator-prey relationship have resulted uh, via the process of natural selection that we've discussed leading to evolution of different species. So here I have a proghorn antelope. It's running quite fast. Check that guy out. Check his turns. Look at those legs allowing for that maneuver to outrun this cheetah. That is quite impressive that that animal is able to do that. And it's because of adaptations, those that are better able to run away from the cheetahs, uh, let it to be more successful and not be preyed upon. Porcupines having those mechanical structures to ward off predators, those quills, they can use it for protection. Mimicry is a really cool adaptation to ward off predators. So it's actually a copycat event where you are imitating um, something that would ward off the predator, that would make the predator go away and leave you alone. So here is, this is actually not a snake. It looks like a snake. Look at those eyes, uh, the body and the way that um, he bends his uh, segmented uh, portion of the abdomen right there. That's actually a caterpillar. The caterpillar is imitating, it's mimicking a snake so that those um, organisms that would prey upon it, so um, a bird, for instance, a bird is not going to want to be anywhere near that snake. It's not a snake, it's a caterpillar. Rodents as well. I showed you guys a video at the very beginning of the semester on um, pygmy seahorses, and they actually have a really neat adaptation, camouflage. Uh, we also call this cryptic coloration. Uh, see that pygmy seahorse is able to blend into their environment quite beautifully. Uh, if I can't see you, I can't find you. So that predator is going to have a much more difficult time preying upon that organism. The uh, last example I want to show you are these, those really neat creatures, cuttlefishes. Uh, I can actually see, here's a cuttlefish. Check that guy out, that cuttlefish at the beginning of the video. So this is what cuttlefishes look like, but at the beginning, it didn't look like that at all. It looks like a hermit crab, actually. Look at that guy mimicking a hermit crab, but then when he sees, oh, it's another cuttlefish. It's not a predator at all. I'm going to change into my cuttlefish form. So it's pretty cool that cuttlefish are able to do that. They emulate another organism in order to ward off uh, their prey or protect themselves. I'm sorry, ward off their predators or protect themselves. So they're able to do this in order to approach their prey. Maybe their prey is not being too um, alerted because it's a hermit crab, it's not a cuttlefish, and then the cuttlefish can get near and then capture its prey, or it's protecting itself from predators. So it's just a really neat thing that they can do. Herbivory is the next positive-negative uh, interspecific interaction I want to discuss. Herbivory is similar to predation, but instead we're talking about consuming actually plants or algae by an animal. So plants have as well evolved really quick. The plants have a negative relationship with that. They're being consumed. The animal is positive, getting their energy needs. Plants have uh, evolved numerous defenses against this relationship, herbivory, so spines, thorns, toxins will ward off animals that would have otherwise eaten them. This is natural selection occurring. Um, other really neat adaptations have to do with um, 
compounds that are toxic to animals, but not to humans. It's actually quite distasteful for other animals, but to us, it's quite um, tasty. So peppermint, clove, cinnamon, humans quite enjoy these flavors. Other animals, not so much. So this has been a uh, evolution that has occurred in these plants due to herbivory to ward off um, creatures from eating them. Humans are still eating them, so I know it didn't work out to their benefit, but it did over time. It's kind of not the point of evolution, but thankful for these really tasty flavors. Okay, another positive negative relationship are parasites and pathogens. We know all too well right now what's going on in our environment about pathogens. <clears throat> so I'll get to that. Um, so this again is another positive-negative relationship. The parasites and the pathogens will have a positive um, relationship in this category. The host will not. Um, so plants and animals are usually victims of parasites. These are organisms that live in or on a host. They do this, they benefit from their host because they have a spot to live, they get nutrients. Here I'm talking about ticks, aphids, worms, these are all parasites. Here I, actually, I can actually see a parasitic worm inside the eye of a frog. And that parasitic worm is definitely benefiting, the frog is not. Usually, not always, usually these parasites will cause disease in the host. <clears throat> It'll be detrimental to their organ systems. Different parts depends on the parasite. In addition, pathogens are disease-causing organisms such as bacteria, viruses, fungi. Um, I use the word organisms loosely for viruses. Viruses are actually not living. Um, and then protists that I'm actually going to cover as well later on in a lecture. So yeah, what's going on right now? The coronavirus causing COVID-19 um, symptoms. This is very much a pathogen. They are seeking out a host to infect humans and some cats um, in order to replicate and in order to cause more damage and infect more hosts. So definitely not a positive relationship for the host and the humans. This is actually quite bad. Um, it is beneficial to the pathogen since they're acquiring a host and acquiring a means to replicate and infect others. Commensalism is a positive null relationship. Commensalism is going to be an interaction in which the individual of one species benefits and the other species is neither helped nor is harmed. So it's kind of a null relationship where nothing really occurs for one species, but the other one very, very much benefits. Here I have some examples. Here is a cattle egret just kind of sitting, laying down on an herbivore. And the cattle egret is going to have the positive relationship here because when this herbivore grazes the field, he's going to disturb all the different insects that live in that vegetative area. And those insects jump up while well, that egret is right there to capture those insects and get its energy needs. This guy's definitely benefiting from that. This guy, the herbivore, not so much. He's just sitting on his head. He's not really bothered by that egret at all. Uh, here this spider, for some reason, decided to make its home on the antlers of this uh, gazelle. Uh, the gazelle is neither harmed nor is benefiting. The gazelle can still be gazelle and do his thing. That spider is very much benefiting by getting a home. Hermit crabs using dead gastropods, snails, for their protection. That's definitely a positive uh, event for the hermit crabs. They get a home and they get a protective home to ward off predators. Uh, the snails are dead. They're gastropods, so they don't really are harmed either way. They're not dead because of the hermit crab, but the hermit crab uses their shells in order to acquire protection. And I actually have a cute little video to show you guys this relationship. <clears throat> 